Welcome back to the deep dive where we take one topic and really, really go deep. Deep dive. Today, we're diving headfirst into the world of military space operations. Uh -huh. And trust me, this isn't your average spacewalk. Right. We're talking about a whole new battlefield, mm -hmm. one with higher stakes than like a game of cosmic billiards. Okay. Played out with satellites instead of stripes and solids. Mm. Joining me to navigate this complex landscape is expert speaker. Welcome. I'm ready to have my assumptions challenged and my understanding of space, well, expanded. It's great to be here. And you're right. Space operations are about so much more than just, you know, rockets and astronauts. Let's just say the reality is a lot more strategic and a lot less Hollywood. I'm all ears. We're diving into Chapter 2 of Space Doctrine Publication 30 Operations, a document that truly lays bare the reality of the space environment and how it's become crucial for modern militaries. To kick things off, how does this document define space as an operational domain? Because it feels like it's about more than what's happening, you know, thousands of miles above us. You hit the nail on the head. This document emphasizes that space operations involve three interconnected segments. There's the orbital segment, the, you know, quote unquote, final frontier we picture with satellites and astronauts. But equally vital is the terrestrial segment, all the systems here on Earth that support space operations. And bridging these two is the link segment the communication and data transfer lifelines. So it's like a three-part system where if, if one piece fails, the whole structure is compromised. Exactly. Imagine a cyber attack on a ground station right here on Earth. It could cripple a satellite's ability to function thousands of miles away. What happens here has a ripple effect reaching all the way to orbit and vice versa. Disruptions in space can directly impact our everyday lives, you know, down here. Wow, that puts things into perspective. Yeah. The document also mentions something called orbital regimes. Um, it's described as being structured like layers, almost like those of an onion around Earth. That's a great way to visualize it. We have the geocentric regime dominated by Earth's gravity. It's the most familiar to us as it's where most of our satellites operate. But there's also the cislunar regime, the space between Earth and the moon, including the moon's orbit. So we're not just talking about Earth anymore. The moon is becoming part of this operational space. Does this link to the recent surge in missions aiming to, like, establish a more permanent presence on the moon, even, like, lunar bases? Absolutely. And it's not just about planting a flag on the moon. The cislunar regime offers unique vantage points and resources. Whoever holds a strategic advantage there could dictate the future of space exploration and resource utilization. That sounds like the setup for a sci-fi thriller, except this is very much a reality we're moving towards. What about the third regime mentioned? The solar regime. Now, the solar regime encompasses the entire solar system with the sun as its gravitational anchor. While we're not launching military operations out that far yet, understanding its dynamics is crucial. You mean things like solar flares and how they can mess with our tech here on Earth? Exactly. And as we venture further out, having accurate space weather forecasts based on the solar regime becomes crucial. Imagine an EMP blast from a solar flare knocking out communications during a critical mission. That's why understanding this regime is vital, even if it seems a bit distant right now. It's like they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, even in space. But for now, let's zoom back in on the geocentric regime, the area we're most active in. This document mentions various types of orbits within this regime. LEO, MEO, GGO, HEO. What's the strategic significance of putting a satellite in a specific orbit? It all comes down to what you want to achieve. LEO, or low Earth orbit, is like the express lane. Satellites here move fast, making it ideal for Earth observation, communication, and even things like the International Space Station. It's close, it's fast, and it gives a great overall view. So for real-time data and keeping a close eye on things, ILEO is where it's at. What about something like GEO, geosynchronous Earth orbit? GEO is all about persistence. Imagine a satellite synchronized with a specific point on Earth. It's like it's hovering, providing constant coverage of a particular region, making it perfect for communication satellites. Exactly. So if you're streaming this podcast, there's a good chance a satellite in GEO is making that possible. That's mind-blowing. Okay. okay, so we've got LEO for speed and GEO for persistence. What about MEO and HEO? Where do they fit into the picture? MEO, or medium Earth orbit, is where things get precise. It's the realm of GPS satellites finding that sweet spot between coverage and accuracy. And then there's HEO, highly elliptical orbit, for those times when you need to linger over specific regions, especially at high latitudes. Imagine a satellite swinging close to Earth, gathering data, then swooping far out, only to return for another pass. It's like choosing the right tool for the job. 
If you need constant global coverage, you're not going to launch a satellite into HEO, even if it seems like the most interesting orbit. Precisely. Each orbit has its strengths and limitations, and understanding these is crucial for maximizing a satellite's effectiveness. But here's the catch. Even with the perfect orbit, a satellite is only as good as its connection back to Earth. You're talking about those lines of communication, right? Yeah. The document really emphasizes their vulnerability, painting them as a potential Achilles heel for space operations. Absolutely. It's not just about losing contact, although that's bad enough. If those lines are cut, whether by accident or malicious intent, we lose access to vital data and control. Imagine a critical Earth observation satellite going dark during a natural disaster. The consequences could be significant. So it's about more than just a few missed phone calls then. Maintaining those communication lines is essential for everything from national security to disaster response. What kind of threats are we talking about here? Is it just about protecting against enemy interference or are there other factors at play? It's a complex landscape and the document doesn't shy away from that. Of course, there are the deliberate threats like jamming signals or even more malicious acts like cyber attacks. But we also have to contend with things like space debris, solar flares, interfering with signals, even unintentional interference from other satellites. Okay, so it's like trying to hold a conversation at a rock concert. There's the noise you expect, but then there's the unexpected feedback screech that blows out the speakers. Mm. But instead of a ruined concert, we're talking about potentially jeopardizing critical missions in space. You've got it. And speaking of those unexpected screeches, let's talk about the natural hazards of space. We often think of space as this empty void, but it's anything but. Right. It's not all peaceful blackness and twinkling stars. This document doesn't sugarcoat the harsh realities of operating in such an extreme environment. What are some of the biggest natural threats that stand out to you? Well, solar flares are a big one. They can release massive bursts of energy, causing electromagnetic interference that can disrupt communications, damage satellites, and even impact power grids here on Earth. It's like a sudden EMP blast from the sun. So those beautiful auroras we see after a solar storm are a stark reminder of the potential havoc these events can wreak on our technology. Exactly. Then we have galactic cosmic rays, high energy particles that bombard our solar system from distant supernovae and black holes. They can cause glitches in electronics, degrade solar panels, and even pose health risks to astronauts. Imagine tiny, invisible bullets constantly peppering your spacecraft. That's galactic cosmic radiation. And then there's the issue of space debris. It sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, but it's a growing problem, isn't it? Absolutely. Every satellite launch, every collision, even a routine spacecraft maneuver can create thousands of pieces of debris from spent rocket stages to flecks of paint all whizzing around at incredible speeds. It reminds me of that scene in the movie Gravity where a chain reaction of debris causes catastrophic damage, except this isn't science fiction. It's a very real danger. Exactly. Even a small piece of debris can cause significant damage when it hits a satellite at thousands of miles per hour. And it's not just about the immediate impact. Collisions can create a cascade effect, generating even more debris and turning valuable orbits into minefields. It sounds like we're creating a self-inflicted wound here. We're so focused on getting things into space that we're not thinking enough about the long-term consequences. That's a critical point. The document highlights the importance of space sustainability, of designing missions and technologies that minimize debris and ensure responsible use of this precious resource. So it's about finding ways to clean up after ourselves, even in space. But even with those efforts, it seems like the space environment itself presents enough challenges. It does. And on top of those natural hazards, we have the very real and evolving threats posed by human actions. You're talking about the weaponization of space, right? The things that keep strategists up at night. It's one thing to worry about, like malfunctioning equipment or even the occasional piece of space debris. But the idea of deliberate attacks in space takes things to a whole new level. It does. And it's not just about countries lobbing missiles at each other in space, although that's certainly part of the equation. The document lays out a spectrum of threats, ranging from directed energy weapons that can blind or disable satellites to cyber attacks that can disrupt communications or even take control of space assets. So we're talking about like a potential cyber warfare battleground, but instead of happening in the digital realm, it's playing out thousands of miles above our heads. What kind of defenses do we have against these types of threats? That's the million dollar question. And it's something that, you know, keeps strategists up at night. We're talking about developing resilient systems, hardening defenses against cyber attacks, and even deploying dedicated space surveillance platforms to keep an eye on what other actors are doing. It's like we're in a constant game of chess, always trying to anticipate the next move and safeguard our assets in space. But here's something I've always wondered. 
With the vastness of space, how can we even be sure what's a threat and what's just a random event? It's not like there are cameras covering every square inch of orbit. You're right, and that's one of the biggest challenges in space operations, distinguishing between natural occurrences, technical malfunctions, and deliberate acts aggression. The document calls it anomaly attribution, and it's essentially space forensics. So it's like trying to solve a crime scene, but the evidence is scattered across millions of cubic miles of space. How do you even begin to piece together what happened? It requires a fusion of data from multiple sources, mm. everything from ground-based sensors to space-based telescopes to intelligence reports. It's about connecting the dots, analyzing patterns, and making educated guesses based on often very limited information. And I imagine there's a lot of uncertainty involved. How can we be sure we're making the right call, especially when the stakes are so high? That's the constant challenge. And it's one of the reasons why space operations require a high degree of expertise and judgment. It's not just about having the technology, it's about having skilled analysts who can interpret the data, assess the situation, and advise decision makers on the best course of action. It's a heavy responsibility, especially when you consider that space is a 247, always on domain. There's no room for downtime or taking a break when it comes to space operations. Absolutely. The document emphasizes the importance of continuous global operations, of maintaining constant vigilance and being prepared to respond to events as they unfold, regardless of the time or day. It makes you realize how much work goes on behind the scenes. All the people in technology working tirelessly to keep things running smoothly in space, even when we're completely oblivious down here on Earth. It's a testament to the dedication and ingenuity of everyone involved in space operations. From the engineers who design and build the satellites, to the analysts who monitor their every move, to the decision makers who bear the ultimate responsibility for their use. This deep dive has been a real eye-opener. We've covered so much ground, from the basics of orbital mechanics to the very real threats facing space operations today. If there's one key takeaway you want our listeners to remember, what would it be? I think the biggest takeaway is that space is no longer some distant frontier with little relevance to our daily lives. It's a critical domain that underpins our national security, our economy, and even our ability to communicate with each other. And as we become increasingly reliant on space, it's more important than ever to understand the complexities of operating in this challenging and rapidly evolving environment. Well said. And on that note, I want to thank you, expert speaker, for joining us on a deep dive and sharing your incredible knowledge with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. The pleasure was all mine. It's always rewarding to talk about something I'm passionate about, and I hope our listeners found it as engaging as I did. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the world of military space operations. We hope you've gained a new appreciation for the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead as we continue to explore and utilize this incredible frontier. Until next time, keep looking up.